Well, sir, thank you so very much for your time. So, you know, our idea was to speak with experts in different countries and just to ask about the experience and through the principles and the ideas uh, you got here in the United States, how to organize yourself, how to, you know, to prepare yourself for some, something like we see in Ukraine. So for some disaster or for some natural disaster or, you know, for some war events which might happen. So um, could you firstly describe how it's organized in America? Uh, what people do, what's your advice, what's your vision? Well, unfortunately, um, Americans have no formal organized civil defense. Um, after World War II, Americans, uh, physicists, began experimenting with different ways of protecting the civilian population from nuclear weapons effects. And we did a lot of testing at the Nevada test site with nuclear weapons and shelter, different, different shelter designs. And we learned a lot about uh, um, that subject. However, um, American politicians and military officials became hostile to civil defense programs because they competed with weapons programs for money. So the decision was made um, in the Johnson administration to scrap civil defense basically and rely solely on deterrence, uh, which is, a, in my view, a very short-sighted um, approach to this. So Americans are basically on their own. They have no um, reliable, accurate government source to go to for accurate information on, on um, sustaining themselves through uh, an attack crisis. They have no information on uh, shelter construction principles. Um, there is no accurate information available from the government as concerning nuclear weapons effects. So basically we're on our own. And fortunately, um, my friends are, have been uh, exposed to a number of nuclear weapons physicists from the national laboratories for about 15 years who gave generously of their time and expertise and taught us all about weapons effects and shelter design and um, um, command and control of nuclear forces. Um, behaviors of buried structures under blast insult, all sorts of things that were well within their area of expertise. And um, they've all passed on now. So um, there, we, I, we don't have any more of those luminaries that are left from the testing years to um, give anybody advice. So uh, basically there's only a handful of people who paid close attention to all this uh, and We've been trying to share what we know with as many people as possible because I'm, I'm not 20 years old anymore. So uh, I imagine that the uh, Ukraine people can teach Americans a great deal about what is going on, how people cope with um, shattered infrastructure, uh, shattered supply chains, um, constant um, bombardment. And um, it's my understanding, especially from watching recent news reports, that Ukraine built a lot of shelters under their large apartment buildings and in other places during the Soviet era. And that has served you well. Um, you know, don't you think that uh, Ukrainian story and Ukrainian events might be a lesson for America and for the world? Because Absolutely. No, no one was ready. No one was prepared. Oh, oh, after the Soviet times, no one was doing anything. And, you know, even the shelters which are uh, in the basement of the apartment buildings, part of them was sold, part of them was not prepared. No one believed that in 21st century the war might happen. That, that's correct. I, I, watched, I watched the uh, months leading up to the invasion, and Ukrainians seemed very unconcerned. Uh, even, even your leadership was unconcerned and downplayed the uh, intelligence that was being provided them with, you know, the troop buildups and the staging of armored vehicles and aircraft around your borders. And uh, I was convinced from the very beginning that uh, the invasion would occur. 
but even uh, American uh, retired consultants for news outlets were convinced that Vladimir Putin was just bluffing and was trying to extract concessions from the West on, on NATO posturing and so forth. But uh, I think I have a better idea of the character of Vladimir Putin than a lot of people. And I believe he was coming in from the very beginning. But, you know, we saw this very same thing uh, in the Soviet Union in the months leading up to the uh, Operation Barbarossa, where the Nazis invaded uh, Russia with four million troops. And, um, you know, there was very little concern among the Russian people that uh, this was, you know, developing. Um, and, well, there's a great book out there called The 900 Days. And it focuses on the siege of Leningrad, but the first 150 pages or so deals with this exact thing that you saw in Ukraine, where, where there was there was very little preparation, very little anticipation of the invasion. And and um, history repeats itself tragically. But uh, yes, but you see, the Ukrainians hold a lot of lessons for the world on on. Um, you know, your people have just been phenomenal in in resisting and fighting back. And, uh, you know, everyone thought this was all going to be over in a week. And uh, obviously, as we see, it hasn't. And um, my hat is off to the courage of the Ukrainian people in all this. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I, I really appreciate your words. Uh, I, I just want to ask you, um, I have seen, oh, I have studied American media, and I have seen a lot of reportages, not maybe a lot, about some people who are uh, preparing, uh, who are transferring their buildings, residential buildings, or, oh, you know, just in buildings in the rural area, who are transferring them into some kind of shelters or some kind of bunkers. Uh, they're, you know, just storing water, they're storing food. How, how, how? Oh, often it happens is it just an exception mostly or um, it's for america prior to the covid pandemic i would say less than one percent of the u.s population was doing anything seriously to uh, prepare for um, war or social civil breakdown uh supply chain failure uh a lot of talk in the prepper community uh, concerned electromagnetic pulse attack from either North Korea or any of the other nuclear armed adversaries. Um, but the but the number of Americans who actually built shelters was very tiny, a very small fraction of the population, less less than half of one percent, or doing anything like that. But a lot of Americans, maybe now now after and during the pandemic, I would say that number has risen to maybe five or six percent are storing food, uh, addressing where they would get a sustainable supply of water uh, and taking those kinds of measures. But shelters are very expensive and they're, they're beyond the reach of the average American middle-class working you know, American to go out and spend $150,000 on a, on a usable, credible shelter. So it's not happening uh, like it should. And what America needs is uh, a Swiss style civil defense program where the government subsidizes the cost of the shelters in residences and, and uh, any building intended for human habitation in Switzerland has a blast hardened shelter in it with a certified air handling system capable of full NBC um, operations. And um, I toured Swiss shelters for two weeks in 1999. And every place we went, the watch shop, the grocery store, uh, movie theaters, churches, homes, businesses, they all had hardened shelters on the premises. So uh, I was very impressed with the Swiss commitment to protecting their, their civil population. Uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, South Korea, uh, Yugoslavia had a large civil defense program. Um, that's basically, and, and Russia has rebuilt their shelter uh, program in, in recent years. And, um, you know, that that demonstrates to me a commitment to protecting their civil population that we just don't have. 
uh, how would you explain that American government is avoiding uh, decisions like that? Um, I remember that, uh, like in 1960s, uh, in Western Virginia, um, it was a gray, huge shelter, which is Greenwood, I guess. The Greenbrier. Is, yeah, yeah, Greenbrier, which was built under the hotel, which was built in mountains, which was able to, you know, to carry all the Congress members, all the people of the government. Uh, was it an understanding that war will happen anymore? So why, after all this, you know, um, capacities, all these efforts, uh, we don't see something like this in uh, 2020? I think that it will take a massive loss of life to change the American mindset on this. Um, so uh, on, in one breath, American officials tell tell people that the shelters don't work but on the other hand they're building lavish shelters for government officials so obviously they know that shelters work uh because they spend considerable sums on protecting you know the the, the government leadership um but you're all expendable and that all that hails back to a doctrine called mutual assured destruction that was um, created by Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. And his idea was that we avoid war by um, deliberately leaving our civil and military population completely vulnerable to nuclear attack to prove our sincerity that we would never attack them. Uh, and of course that assumes that uh, that our enemies are uh, of similar mindset, that they want to avoid war. But when I study the Russian force structure, uh, I see that every detail uh, of actually fighting and winning a nuclear war is in place in their program. The United States does not have a doctrine of, of fighting and winning a nuclear war, only deterrence. And um, our, our adversaries, our, our near peer adversaries have a very different mindset in that regard. So China has shelters uh, in their major cities. Um, China and Russia and Germany all have real world ex wartime experience with trying to maintain a manufacturing base under combat conditions. And they realize that without civilians, you cannot manufacture tanks, artillery pieces, helmets, belt buckles. You can't process food, package food. You can't manufacture transportation fuels and all those sorts of things if your civilian population is dead or dying. So they realize the enormous importance of civil defense. But America has not fought a war on its own soil since the American Civil War in 1865. So we're, we kind of live in a state of denial here in the United States. Thank you so very much. I got maybe the last question to you. If the ordinary American, you know, your friend or friend of the friend will ask your advice, look into Ukraine, look into uh, aggressive policy of North Korea. What can I do myself to protect, to protect myself, to protect the family? Which advice will you give? Do, will you advise to create the shelter? Will you advise, you know, to, to make the supplies? So how do you see what the ordinary person uh, not the state for the person, but the person itself, himself, may do to protect himself and the family. The first, the first advice I give is um, to acquire as much basic non-perishable food as they can practically store, rice, beans, wheat, corn, those kinds of things that stored for many decades uh, and still remain usable. Uh, and the next critical thing is water. Uh, be able to purify, you know, natural sources of water if you can get to those. Um, the experts at the national laboratories estimate that that about 60 to 70 million Americans would perish from nuclear weapons effects, either prompt or delayed, either the, you know, the prompt effects of the weapons or fallout casualties later, many months later. Uh, but about 200 million would perish from starvation. So if war comes to the United States or any other country, the first thing that will, will fall apart is the supply chain. So people will have to feed themselves 
they will have to have their own um, modest reserve of transportation fuel uh, and food and water. And if you don't have those things, you're in big trouble. So food, water, all those kinds of things, shelter, the ability to, to shelter your family it, initially from the elements, you know, winter is here. Uh, and so the, uh, the sheltering, the bomb shelter um, phase of everything is kind of the last thing because it's, it's expensive and a lot fewer people can afford that, but they can afford rice and beans. Every time they go to the store, they should buy extra rice and beans uh, because they together, eating together, make a complete protein and will sustain a person in good health for years. Uh, it's not lasagna. It's not, uh, you know, French pastry. It's not particularly, you know, appetizing, but it will keep you alive and healthy for a long, long time. So that that's that's where I start out is food, water. What about energy? Look into Ukraine. Russia started to bombing uh, Ukrainian energy facilities. And, you know, my family, my friends, they're telling me that they got electricity for like two, three hours per day. So yeah. they're thinking, uh, you know, in, the, in this madness, madness without electricity, without water, because uh, water supply is not working without electricity, uh, you know, without heat, because heat is not working without electricity. So how to protect yourself in case of, you know, energy crisis? Well, that I'm glad you brought up energy because that's a critical component uh, for sure. Um, I, I advocate for micro solar power systems because without electricity uh of course in the big see uh, our modern cities are all wired for efficient production and distribution of electricity and therefore we have water and natural gas as a result of that so like my drinking water comes from 60 miles away from a reservoir and then it goes to a treatment plant and then it goes into a water tower where gravity, you know, being in the water, using gravity, the water tower pressurizes the lines. Well, without all that sophisticated system, you don't have any water. And without water, you die in a few days. Uh, so I, I advocate, you know, um, a self-sustaining, modest power supply. Uh, and solar seems to be the best because it doesn't break and it doesn't consume uh, petrol fuels it's not relying on petrol uh, and and that's going to give you the energy that you need to say want, run your own water purification system that will process hundreds of gallons a day instead of a few quarts or liters so uh, i'll be happy to uh, text you some photographs of of the water pur purification and electrical system that i developed at my property but, you know, a lot of Americans, you know, I say a lot, you know, people in particular who live in, in rural areas, um, they, they're, they're taking a serious look at having their own power supply so they can run their own wells or operate an alternative water supply system. Um, but if you live in the city, you know, you've, you've got a real challenge there to find any source of water to even purify on your own. So um, I've read a number of studies by the national laboratories on the effects of electromagnetic pulse. Uh, and everything, everything revolves around grid power in this country. Uh, and I noticed that my local gas station, which is a big box chain like Costco, uh, they get four double tanker trucks every day to run that gas station. So every three hours, a double tanker truck drives up and drops fuel into those supply tanks, those storage tanks. And when those trucks stop coming, we're out of fuel, okay? So as a consequence, I have maintained my own uh, supply of diesel fuel, several thousand gallons uh, at any one time. Uh, so, because I don't like being vulnerable to, to that distribution system. So anyway, that's, you know, we've tried to cover all the bases, 
but th that takes time for the average American or anyone to uh, get all this together and and it's expensive. So, but it's doable by the average person if they commit to it. They're not going to be able to afford a nice car anymore. They'll have to drive around in an old car, but it's doable. Thank you so very much. You were super useful and you, you gave me a lot of information. I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you.